You want to play some word games or do some experiments on me or anything? No. Ran on his arm, he stacked charm around your neck. Strung out a thin, calling some friend, trying to cash some check. He's acting dumb, that's what you've come to expect. For the depression unit, I'd like you to be able to describe the dexamethasone suppression test and its relevance in depression and cushions. I would like you to be able to compare and contrast dysthemia from hypomania and recognize uh, drugs commonly used to treat bipolar disorder and cyclothemia. Describe the mechanism of action through which tricyclic antidepressants, MAO inhibitors, and SSRIs work acutely. Uh, I uh, describe uh, observations with reserpine and depressive symptoms. Describe the theory of serotonin sensitivity and issues with the traditional view of hyposerotonin uh, function and depression. Identify alternative treatments, including ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and deep brain stimulation, ketamine, and vagal nerve stimulation. Depression is the most common mood disorder. It's characterized by unhappy mood, loss of interest, energy and appetite, difficulty in concentration, and restless agitation. Unipolar depression is depression that alternates with normal emotional states. Depression may last for several months, and it can be lethal, as shown in our little intro uh, clip. Uh, about 80% of all suicide victims are profoundly depressed. One, there are several treatments for depression. One is uh, electroconvulsive shock therapy, which causes a seizure by passing an electrical current through the brain. You know, there are a variety of out reasons or hypotheses out there by which, uh, you know, this might work. But, you know, banking off of the seizure idea, uh, one idea is that you, you basically train the brain to recreate surround inhibition on its own, to sort of shut off sort of sporadic, uh, you know, uh, bursts of activity. Transcranial magnetic stimulation also, also can alter cortical electrical activity. One benefit here is that it is incredibly non-invasive. Uh, you know, there, you, you wouldn't really feel much. You know, they, they put basically coiled magnets over specific areas, like possibly Rodman's Area 44. And, uh, you know, that can lead to some efficacy in the treatment of depression. 
Uh, monoamine oxidase is an enzyme that normally inactivates the monoamines, noradrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin. So when you treat a patient with an MAO inhibitor, it would raise the level of the monoamines at the synapse. Uh, you know, it, it takes a couple of weeks for this to actually be effective at treating uh, depressive symptoms in a subset of individuals. And what is thought to occur there is a series of changes in uh, really the first dominoes seem uh, are thought to involve the noradrenergic system. Uh, it would lead to changes in uh, alpha and beta uh, receptor expression, and then also downstream changes in serotonin uh, receptor expression. And it's really these long-term changes that occur over a couple of weeks that are thought to be uh, involved in uh, the long-term treatment of depression. So MAO inhibitors were really the first antidepressants uh, that led to the monoamine hypothesis of depression. Reserpine is a drug that uh, reduces or depletes monoamines in the brain, and it can cause symptoms of depression, further supporting the monoamine hypothesis of depression. Uh, in addition, tricyclic drugs uh, uh, block reuptake of monoamines, also supporting the monoamine hypothesis, as do SSRIs. Uh, you know, one interesting thought here is that, uh, you know, amphetamines and dopamine releasers were used uh, off-label to treat depression for decades before uh, MAO inhibitors and tricyclics became common. Really, uh, you know, nobody really started using these drugs, even though some of them were available until amphetamines became more tightly regulated around 1979. Up until that point, I would argue that many people were using amphetamines to self-medicate or, uh, or doctors even prescribing it to medicate uh, lethargy or depression, in other words. Um, and, uh, you know, one might infer then that, uh, you know, dopamine might play a prominent role in depression, especially a hypodopaminergic state, uh, which is the idea behind bupropion, the well butrin which selectively increases dopamine and noradrenaline by blocking their uptake inhibitors. Has no effect on serotonin whatsoever, yet is effective at treating depression in a subset of individuals. And you're going to hear me come back to this uh, idea again and again, that you know, there, there, there appear to be multiple uh, neurobiological alterations that can lead to a depressive phenotype. Uh, therefore, in the future, hopefully, we can tailor the pharmacology better to the patient. Uh, and rather than just putting somebody through a battery of six or seven drugs in a row until you find out what's effective, maybe by using pharmacogenomics or some other sort of uh, approach, you could determine whether or not you bupropion, an SSRI, an MAO inhibitor, or something else might be most effective at treating depression in the individual subject. So despite the fact that tricyclics and MAO inhibitors seem to first have their most drastic changes on the noradrenergic system, alpha and beta receptors, uh, serotonin has really received the greatest deal of interest. And a lot of this is because SSRIs are much safer than MAO inhibitors uh, and tricyclic antidepressants. MAO inhibitors in particular are tricky and difficult because uh, of enzymatic interactions in the liver. Uh, you know, for example, if you eat cheese or red wine on an MAO inhibitor, it can lead to uh, increases in chemicals that can lead to cardiac uh, arrest and it can kill you. So, uh, you know, SSRIs have really become one of the most uh, prescribed uh, drugs for not only anxiety, but also depression. And uh, one thought there is that maybe they're most effective at treating patients with depression who are comorbid with uh, anxiety, and maybe a lot of the effects are on anxiety. However, uh, there is uh, no question that there are a percentage of people that are uh, effectively treated for their depression by SSRIs. Uh, you know, you've probably heard in other classes that this is primarily a placebo effect. I would uh, challenge you to look into the literature yourself. You will find that uh, you know, the literature shows that SSRIs, uh, that the placebo effect might account for up to 
of uh, SSRI efficacy and treatment of depression. Uh, you know, I think that's very interesting. There are probably a lot of placebo effects in most pharmacotherapeutic interventions. Uh, you know, it's incredibly well documented. Uh, you know, but that's no reason to uh, throw out the, the SSRIs uh, because they're still effective in 50% of the population. So, uh, you know, and uh, again, they are much safer than a lot of these other compounds. Bupropion can give you seizures. Uh, MAO inhibitors can kill you. SSRIs, you know, they, they, there's some uh, argument about suicidal uh, increases, but that one's a tricky tricky, uh, slippery slope. And that reason why is that in suicidal, when you have a condition like depression that is highly associated with suicide, how do you know the person wasn't going to commit suicide anyway? You, know, you really don't. So, uh, you know, the idea that SSRIs increase risk of suicide, I, I think, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a pretty big caveat. Uh, that And I think that uh, they're certainly safer than MAO inhibitors and some other drugs out there. So as a summary of the acute action of the primary three classical approaches for treating depression, MAO inhibitors, tricyclics, and SSRIs. If you really want to get into the long-term mechanisms that occur over two weeks that are actually responsible for uh, the antidepressant effect, uh, you know, take my drugs class. We go over that in detail. But, uh, you know, here I think just a general understanding of how they act uh, immediately, uh, you know, is a, a good, uh, you know, step forward. But just know that's the first domino. And that alone isn't actually what's causing uh, the antidepressant effects. Those emerge over a couple of weeks and are typically due to the result of flooding the system with serotonin or noradrenaline. So MAO inhibitors inhibit the enzyme monoamine oxidase, which breaks down serotonin, noradrenaline, and dopamine. Tricyclics inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine, serotonin, and or dopamine. Again, both of these are first thought to uh, really produce the long-term uh, long changes on the noradrenergic system, with the alpha and beta receptors being profoundly affected. And then you start to get some serotonin uh, receptor changes uh, over you know uh, weeks as well. SSRIs are more selective at uh, the serotonin uh, system, but again, you're going to hear this sort of recurring idea that noradrenaline is probably pretty important here and is often overlooked in the commercials. So uh, SNRIs uh, also target the noradrenergic or norepinephrine system uh, selectively. So, you know, one thing that I do want to point out that it's not like the commercials. I mean, it's not the increase in serotonin that is uh, immediately effective at treating depression. If that were true, you would have immediate results. But instead, you have to wait several weeks before you start seeing effects, suggesting that it's really the second, third, and fourth domino that fall that are really due to, so I mean, like going back to this anxiety idea, you know, in the treatment of anxiety, it's uh, very clear that, I mean, increasing serotonin increases anxiety, but SSRIs are effective at treating anxiety. The idea here is that the long-term changes postsynaptically, sort of like your deadening postsynaptic responses and these sorts of things. Uh, so, uh, you know, and it's also, I think, uh, worth noting that the, uh, you know, the SSRIs, um, you know, yeah, like they, they uh, do have that long lag time between treatment and the reduction of symptoms. And it's also true that not everybody is helped by SSRIs. I mean, there is a large placebo effect, uh, approximately 50%, but note that that's not 100%, now is it? Uh, you know, and I think most psychiatric drugs, uh, a lot of them are going to come with a placebo effect. Uh, oh, yes, and the other idea there is that, uh, you know, in the, if you look at the prescribing guidelines of SSRIs for depression, particularly in patients that are comorbid with anxiety, which is a lot of them, you find that the uh, uh, anxiety is going to increase at first. That's why they want to start you at a low dose and taper it up. Uh, the reason that they titrate or taper the dose up slowly is so that the anxiety isn't so severe on day one, which would completely, you know, uh, 
ruin everything. I mean, like it would uh, ruin compliance or the idea of staying on the medication if you make the anxiety so severe. There are many other treatments out there being developed. Uh, one is ketamine. Ketamine is an interesting one. It's an NMDA receptor antagonist. It would produce, uh, you know, dissociate, di dissociative hallucinations in the high dose range. These are typically auditory in nature rather than visual. Uh, that's why particularly you see lots of uh, clubbers abusing ketamine. But the, uh, you know, like when there's just the, the boom, boom, the, the, the crazy noise and all of this. But, uh, you know, it's not exactly clear why ketamine is effective, but one beautiful thing about ketamine is that you don't have to wait for three weeks. It seems like the effects might be more rapid, which is incredibly important if you have a suicidal patient, who would also be a very good candidate for electroconvulsive therapy. Of course, this is not in vogue, but I challenge you to look into the literature on ECT. You'll find that it is an incredibly safe uh, ECT is just not popular because it was ruined by Jack uh, Nicholson, or uh, Nicholas, no, Nicholson. And uh, one, fl uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, which sort of uh, demonized it and made it look like this horrible monstrosity of a thing. But uh, it, it's really incredibly safe, particularly if you're given the proper pharmacotherapy in advance to reduce spasms and these sorts of things that actually would hurt or could hurt. Uh, deep brain stimulation is uh, another option where you actually implant uh, stimulating electrodes in certain areas of the brain. Uh, it is thought that this might actually inhibit the region of interest, uh, you know, as we've already gone over a little bit in the motor section. Vagal nerve stimulation is another interesting one. This, in my opinion, is sort of more of a, like a shotgun gun theory, but uh, you know, it, it certainly works. Uh, in a lot of patients who receive it. Uh, you know, and of course we are in a psychology department. Uh, I would be uh, you know, failing if I did not mention cognitive behavioral therapy, which is uh, very well, very effective at correcting negative thinking and improving interpersonal relations. It, it, you know, I think that uh, any credible uh, you know, scientist that studies these things should you know, have a balanced approach or push a balanced approach between the biomedical and the psychosocial side. So, you know, the idea is that the two are better together. It's not a competition, guys. It's not that, you know, the psychotherapy is better than the pharmacotherapy or the pharmacotherapy is better than the psychotherapy. The two together is certainly going to be more effective than uh, either by itself, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, I, I will say, though, uh, one pro about pharmacotherapy, you know, if you really wanted to get into the debate, is that it's more affordable. So, I mean, if you think about this from a taxpayer perspective, uh, you know, all of these things cost a lot of money. And sometimes psychiatric patients don't have a lot of money, unfortunately. So, uh, you know, a lot of the burden can be pushed onto the taxpayer, or even worse, left untreated, which is going to cost the taxpayer even more. So, uh, you know, if you were looking for probably the cheapest possible way to offer treatment, it would be through a uh, generic available pharmacotherapy, which can cost 10 cents a pill. Uh, you know, therapy, it would be great, you know, if it was, uh, you know, more subsidized, but that is going to cost the taxpayer a little bit more money. Thinking of non-serotonin-based ideas and the theory of the etiology of depression, I think one of the most fascinating ones to me is Cushing syndrome. So in Cushing syndrome, patients have a high level of adrenoglucocorticoids because their feedback loop is broken, essentially. I'll go over that in a minute. Uh, but Cushing's patients are also 100% across the board, almost always, prone to depression. They also have a very difficult time with metabolic regulation and you know, gain quite a bit of weight. But uh, symptoms of depression, obesity, and uh, body hair changes in people with Cushing syndrome are uh, highly associated with dysfunction of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So I mean, think about that. The HPA axis is, you know, sort of the uh, stress uh, function, like you know, it, it, the fight or flight uh, system in the body. So if your fight or flight system was broken 
and it was always on, think about what that would be like. It would not be good. You know, like the idea that, uh, you know, HPA access uh, dysregulation might explain cases of depression that are not Cushing's patients as well, I think is uh, an intriguing possibility that could explain a subset of depressed patients regarding the cause or etiology of it. Again, in my opinion, and this is an opinion, is not just one neurobiological basis of depression, but I would also argue that in my opinion, 100% of cases of depression do have a biological basis. If they don't, what is, the, what is the cause? Explain the etiology to me if there isn't a biological basis. But it can be diverse. I mean, you can't have disruption in the HPA axis, disruption in do, a hypodopaminergic state, disruption in noradrenergic or possibly even serotonergic transmission. So here you can see a illustration of the HPA axis. So when uh, a stressor is introduced uh, that might, uh, and it might be advantageous to initially flee or fight, uh, the hypothalam uh, hypothalamus would activate, be activated and release uh, uh, CRF or corticotropin releasing factor. In this uh, illustration, it's uh, abbreviated CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, same difference. Uh, it then activates the uh, anterior pituitary, which would secrete ACTH, which would activate the adrenal gland located on the kidney. This would then release uh, glucocorticoids, including uh, cortisol, which act on the brain to say, freak out, run, fight. Uh, but uh, in a typical situation, negative feedback would then kick in to say, well, let's check this. Is this really such a big deal? Okay, let's turn the system off. In the case of Cushing's, that's broken, and the feedback system isn't functional. So it's just repeat, uh, just fight or flight feeling all the time. Supporting this notion that uh, cortisol uh, disruption could be uh, involved in the etiology of a subset of depressed patients, hospitalized patients with depression often show elevated cortisol levels. The dexamethasone suppression test is one option that you can use to test whether the excess in cortisol release is due to dysfunction of the HPA axis. Uh, you know, this is often seen not only in depressed patients, but also suicidal ones. And again, there's an unfortunate relationship there. Dexamethasone is a synthetic glucocorticoid that can suppress cortisol release in normal patients, but in uh, uh, Cushing's patients or someone with a broken HPA axis. Uh, that cannot uh, undergo this sort of like negative uh, feedback loop to turn it off. Uh, you, you do not see a response to the dexamethasone. Here is just an illustration from your book showing uh, serum or blood cortisol levels between primary depressive patients, psychiatric controls, and normal controls. And as you can see, in patients that report a high degree of depression, and again, in a subset, and again, that's very obvious from this graph, right? In a subset of patients, you see uh, the heightened cortisol levels. So, uh, you know, what might happen then if we gave the dexamethasone suppression test? So here you can see a graph showing what the dexamethasone suppression test would look like in normal controls. On day one, uh, when, uh, before you administer the dexamethasone, you can see heightened uh, cortisol levels, uh, you know, that are really associated with certain times of the day. Uh, a circadian pattern, you know, we unfortunately we don't have time to cover circadian systems in here. I know you do in 2220, so I don't feel that bad skipping it, even though it's fascinating. But uh, you know, dexamethasone uh, then on day two would suppress cortisol levels because it is sort of activating that uh, negative feedback loop. So in contrast here, you can see the pre and post effects of dexamethasone suppression in a depressed patient, uh, in, at least in one who seems to have dysfunction in the HPA axis. 
So here you can see that uh, you see no uh, you know, real reduction in cortisol despite adding the glucocorticoid that would trigger the negative feedback mechanism. So it seems like that negative feedback mechanism is broken a little bit in this patient. More women than men suffer from depression, which could be at least in part due to patterns of help seeking. Women go to the doctors more than men. I mean, like, I'm at fault here myself. I find it very difficult when I sit down with uh, the physician to tell them about, uh, you know, my problems, my ego, my male ego, even though, okay, I guess we're not really about the Freudian ego anymore. But, you know, I'm a neuroscientist, not a psychologist. Cut me a break. So I'm just going to go with ego for now, uh, remnant of the, my 90s uh, collegiate education. But, uh, you know, we, we, the idea here is that men, uh, you know, are just very reluctant to uh, expose themselves, uh, you know, that, and uh, one thing that I can tell you that helps me, guys, uh, is to write it down. Uh, I often write down my problems and email my doctor the day uh, before I go in. Because when I get in there and I see them face to face, you know, I want to put up my, my courageous front, these sorts of things. So that, that's what I do personally to, uh, you know, uh, seek help when I need it. Uh, you know, so th there are also, though, gender differences in endocrine physiology, uh, some related to the menstrual cycle. And it's also worth noting that, uh, uh, you know, there are hormonal changes associated with postpartum depression, uh, you know, further suggesting that there might be uh, a, a major sex difference that can contribute to uh, uh, depression. So I know we're getting long here, but I, I feel like I need to cover bipolar disorder in part because I've just received multiple comments on FCQs. Thank you for covering bipolar disorder. Uh, you know, it's just not something we hear much in our other classes. So bipolar disorder is characterized by periods of depression alternating with expansive mood or mania. The rate of cycling varies. Uh, rapid cycling consists of more, four or more cycles in one year. Uh, some individuals can even cycle several times in one day. In cyclothemia, a milder form of bipolar disorder, patients cycle through dysthemia or mild depression and hypomania or increased energy. Uh, one common treatment uh, in bipolar disorder is lithium, historically speaking at the very least which is a mood stabilizing drug used to treat bipolar disorder. It's also used in many different industrial uh, you know, means and functions. It has widespread action in the brain, which is a, sort of an easy way of saying we don't know exactly how it works. But you know, if you look up any review article on lithium, you're going to find about 20 different pharmacological mechanisms of action uh, so, you know, it, and it could have widespread action, I mean, that, that's very possible. 